guys, exciting video today. We're installing probably my favorite casing, window and door casing I've ever done. Four and a quarter inches wide, one inch thick. If you don't do this right, you can have disasters down the road. I'm gonna show you some tips and tricks in this video on how to handle really big window and door casing. So guys, before we get too far into this, I wanna tell you a story. Almost a decade ago, I witnessed a horrible trim install. One of the first custom homes that I was commissioned to work on had a trim package, a couple hundred thousand dollars with really big casing like this. We started trimming the house early summer, maybe even in the spring, and there were some other guys on the job. I wasn't associated with them but they were not doing anything to reinforce their miters on their casing. And by the time we were partway through the summer in the entire house, all of the miters looked terrible. You'll see in these photos, these are real photos taken several years ago from this job of what will happen if you don't do your miters properly and if you don't condition your job site properly. At the time that we're shooting this video, it's August. And here in the Midwest, we have extreme humidity swings. On this job that I'm referencing from several years ago, the builder did not turn the air conditioning on. So as we started installing our millwork in the spring with lower humidity, the house filled up with humidity and everything started to blow apart. So here in this house, it's a completely different story. The humidity is controlled, the air conditioning is on, which naturally dehumidifies, and it ensures that whenever we install this millwork, it's gonna have the best chance possible of uh, holding up for the long haul. You'll notice in these photos of that job in the past, even the, the newel posts, the trims on the newel posts blew open that's how bad of a humidity issue we had in that house. One thing I've learned over the years is a lot of carpenters don't mean bad. They don't mean to do shoddy work. They just don't know any better. So I'm hoping this video helps you understand what can happen if you don't handle your installations correctly when you're doing nice, big, beefy trim. So we're upstairs here. As you can see, everything is coming together nicely. We've got really nice miters here we've already installed a lot of our casing. Basically, we're fighting a battle on two fronts. One, we gotta have the builder on our side so that the space stays very well conditioned and we keep that humidity level low. But on the other end of things, we also need to make sure that these miters on our casing are gonna hold up for the long haul so that we don't get any breakage across these miters. So that's what I'm gonna show you in this video. I don't have it all figured out, but I've got a pretty good idea on what you need to do and what you don't wanna do after all of the good and the bad I've seen over the years. So going back several years ago, I watched these guys in this other house install casing like this. And sadly, it's how most of the industry still installs casing today. So you're gonna nail your piece onto the wall and old school carpenter is gonna get a little glue you know, maybe smear that on a little bit. He's gonna take his next piece, put it right up there. Hopefully the miter comes together decent. We'll take a couple nails, scissor nail it through the end right there, nail it on. So here's the problem. This actually looks pretty good right now. The problem is whenever you have this much of a mass of wood, any humidity change at all is gonna exert extreme force on this miter. And if it's not reinforced properly, it's just simply gonna open up. It's gonna do whatever it wants. So wood glue is only strong if it has clamping pressure. So by just dabbing some glue on and then putting it together and shooting a couple nails, here through the corner, that really doesn't do anything. You don't have much strength. And especially if your miter isn't absolutely perfect and isn't, doesn't have full surface contact on the whole thing, then it's really not strong. So if this would have been tilted a little bit and it would have been open where there was a gap in there, you have no strength at all. You're just at the mercy of the, the seasonal cycles 
It's just not gonna hold up. So guys, this is what you don't wanna do. It might've worked a couple decades ago when people only had two and a quarter casing that was a half inch thick and you didn't have that much pressure from wood movement. Once we get into these jobs where we've got casing this big, that old mentality is just not gonna do. So let me show you how you should handle casing like this. So I preach job site setup all the time, but again, we've got our trim rack here, casing. I'm gonna pull it right off. In just a matter of a few footsteps, we're on the miter saw wings ready to cut. Quick tip guys, for a long time, I've been a big fan of FS tool miter saw blades. I switched recently and I'm trying a different blade out. This is a forest chop master. It's a little bit more affordable than the FS tool blades but it's very aggressive. You'll notice as I'm cutting this stuff, it really tears through the poplar quickly. Cut quality is decent, um, but I really like how aggressive it is. So getting ready to measure this, another trick here, line up the inside of your miter on the, uh, could be the end of your saw. Here I'm doing it on my crown stop channel. I'm gonna hook my tape on here, and then I'll pull down and mark my measurement. A lot of you guys know in just a few minutes, we're gonna start clam clamping this, this casing together. And with a board, a piece of casing this thick and wide, it doesn't have much flex and give. So if you don't cut your pieces the same length and you go to clamp them up, your miters are not gonna to wanna to come together very well. So I actually just cut a piece and I didn't feel like I got it quite where I wanted to when I cut on my pencil line. What I did was I actually just flipped it over and I aligned the long points on the miter together here. And then I came down here on this end and checked it as well. And what I was looking for was just to ensure that I've got the same length here. And if I've got the same length, my miters will go together well. Previously, it was actually just a hair long and I went and shaved a little bit off. Um, it's just one of those little tips that uh, kind of makes things go better a little bit further down the road. Again, you'll notice workflow. A lot of times you've heard about a kitchen triangle. We have the same thing on a job site here. Material rack, we pull it off, cut it on the saw. We've got our pieces cut and then we're stacking and assembling over here on our assembly table. Minimal number of footsteps, not wasting a bunch of motion, not wasting a bunch of time. So a lot of you guys by now know that a miter without any reinforcement is not overly strong especially whenever you have a very large mass of wood like this, the just power from the wood expanding and contracting is gonna exert a lot of pressure on that miter. So one thing that we're doing on this job that's a little bit different than our other jobs where we typically use hyper adhesive is we're using regular wood glue and a number 20 biscuit in the miters. That biscuit creates a nice strong tenon joint in the miter it makes it a lot stronger. It takes a little bit more labor to do it, but if your builder and homeowner are investing this much money in a large, high quality trim, you really need to take the time to put a tenon in that joint, in my opinion. To me, all it takes is a biscuit. You don't have to be fancy and use dominoes or something like that. A number 20 biscuit is gonna work really well and also you get the added benefit that the biscuit is gonna help align your miters whenever you put these together. Now normally on a typical job site, we're production cutting all of our door casing and window casing 
in batches and then we're starting to assemble in batches and we get a nice rhythm and workflow. I'm not doing that now simply because we're shooting a YouTube video and there's no one else on the job site. But typically you would see a lot of different casing sets stacked up and we'd be doing a lot of these processes in big batches all at the same time. This next step in the process where we put in our slot for our biscuit is actually extremely important. The reason is if you don't mortise it perfectly, uh, whenever you go to put your miters together, they won't align and that's gonna create a ton of extra work sanding. So you wanna make sure you do this well. So I usually take a scrap board and I'll go ahead and mortise my biscuit slot uh, and get, my, get it set so that I've got an equal amount on both sides. So that looks really good right there. Now, does the, the slot for my biscuit need to be perfectly centered? No, it doesn't. Now, here's the interesting thing uh, that we found with this casing profile. If you try to center your mortiser here, it's very unstable. And at first my guy was doing this and he was getting not so great results whenever he went to put the miters together. They just weren't lining up. So I said, well, move, move it over so that your fence is registering better on this portion of the miter. Because again, if you're not familiar with this, this casing has a setback here in the center, a relief cut so that whenever you put your biscuit joiner on there, it may want to rock. So if you've got it all the way over here, this portion of your fence is not registering on this higher part, so now your, your mortise is gonna be at an angle. So what I said is move it all the way over here so that you've got a nice chunk of your fence registering up here and up here, and you'll get much better results that way. So let's go ahead and run these slots. Another key tip, um, you don't want to be taking out your tape measure and measuring the center on every single one of these miters. That's a waste of time and movement. Rather, use your biscuit joiner and find a reference point. So what I'm going to do here, if we come in and look at this, I'm going to position this so that the inside edge of the biscuit joiner lines up with the inside edge of my miter right here. That way I don't ever have to measure anything and I'm always mortising in the exact same position. So we'll start right there. Make sure that you've got really firm pressure so that your fence is sitting down perfectly flat. Again, this is very important. You don't want it to be sitting at an angle. So I'm putting very firm pressure on there. And then we'll work our way through our stack. So this is an actual real life example of what you don't want to have happen and why it's really important that if you're doing this, you're paying attention or if you're delegating this to another guy on your team that they know what they're doing as well. Um, I had my, my grip a little bit too firm whenever I did that and the fence was tilted and I had to remortise that. If you get in here real close, you can see how much that was off. Right there was the difference. That was my first time, and then that's what it actually should have looked like right there. Now, if I hadn't remortised that, which created a larger mortise than I wanted, but I would have went then to align my miters, and this one would have been much higher or much lower than the other one. So if we come up close right here, you don't want to end up trying to put these together and have, have this sitting really high because then that's going to be a pain to sand out. We want to get these biscuit slots so that they're perfect so that when we put this together there's extremely minimal sanding and it'll go really quickly. I mentioned it earlier, but one of the most important things to understand about getting strong joints with wood glue, uh, with tight bond, is that you need to have clamping pressure. If you don't have clamping pressure to get that really thin glue joint, the glue actually doesn't have strength. If you've got any gapping, 
the strength of the glue is just radically decreased. So that's what we're gonna be using these clam clamps for. The difference is where normally I'm using hyper adhesive in my videos, I only need four clamps because the glue dries instantly. Whenever we're doing casing like this, I need a lot more clamps because you need to leave the clamps on the miters longer. Ideally, about a half hour or so is good as long as you don't stress the joint for a little while after that. So we get a nice system and rotation going and by the time we're done with our 20th clamp, we're ready to take the clamps off of the first set we did and it's been setting for at least a half hour or so. So that's what this is. We got a big pile of clamps right here um, and about 16 to 20 of them works decently well. Another little pro tip, this is something that my good friend Justin shared with me many years ago is whenever you buy your biscuits, Lamello makes fantastic biscuits that are all the same consistent width. If you go to the box store and buy biscuits, a lot of times you'll have some that are too thin, some are too fat. Buy the Lamello bulk packs and they're, they're just great. That's the only thing I'll use anymore. I'll put some links to those in the video notes below. You can buy them right off of Amazon. It's time to glue up. There's a couple key rules to remember whenever you're gluing up. One, you need enough glue. Two, you don't want too much glue. The reason you don't want too much glue is you're gonna have to clean it all up after it squeezes out. That's a big waste of time and just kind of annoying. So whenever I glue these, you, I like a, a fast cap glue bot here. I try to get just the right amount on here so that I'm not having to wipe a ton off. And ideally this is about how much I want right there. Give a little wipe on your tool belt. Um, and I do glue both sides. Some guys might only glue one side. I like to glue both sides so that I've got a wet edge on both sides of the miter. Now, a lot of times I'll see guys, whenever they're gluing, they're putting a ton of glue on like this. And I mean, they're just globbing it on. And that is just completely unnecessary. And if you have too much glue, it'll actually compromise the glue joint uh, because it's not allowing the wood to squeeze together. So you don't want too much on there. I'm gonna wipe that off. Now, how do we treat the actual biscuit joint? I'm OCD enough, I like to always put some glue on both sides of the biscuit. I like to know that I've got coverage on the whole biscuit. I'll take this little fast cap glue bot, and I like it because it lets me get right down in there into that tenon. And I want enough in there to get, again, a good glue joint you're gonna get some squeeze out, but you don't want too much. Now it's even more critical that you get the right amount on this one, because if you load this up full of glue, it's not gonna to want to clamp together very well. So just make sure you don't over glue that one. At this point, we're gonna find out how we did when we mortised our mortises for the biscuit. Pushing it together, this is what we get. I'd say this is about right very light squeeze out there. I'm gonna go ahead and remove that glue at this time. We're gonna get a little bit more squeeze out when I put the clam clamp on. With the clam clamp, you're gonna apply firm pressure. I like to keep it pulled inward on this side. And on the cam action side, we'll give it a twist and it's gonna grip right in. I wanna feel and make sure that this is absolutely as close to flush as I can get it because that's gonna be less sanding down the road. Give it a squeeze. We've got a light amount of squeeze out right here. Not bad, no big deal to clean up. That's really pretty ideal, that's what we want. I am also, you're always gonna have a little bit of squeeze out on the bottom. Just lift it up, take your finger and wipe that off. That way it doesn't just get all over your assembly table.
So now we're on to the last corner of our window assembly. A lot of times, if you're gonna have problems, this is where it's gonna happen. If uh, maybe your casing had a bow in it and the miters weren't cut perfectly, Another thing is if your saw is not calibrated correctly and you're not cutting a true 45 degree, you'll get everything together, you'll get to your fourth corner and it might have a gap like it doesn't wanna to come together. So this is where you can have some issues. If you put your clamp on it, you clamp it up and you've still got a little bit of space, um, pinch dogs can be great. You can just take a pinch dog and put it in. Maybe if I've got a gap up here, I'll put it in up top. I've got a gap down here, I'll put it down on the bottom, but that helps clamp it in tighter and um, just takes a little bit of the tension uh, and the responsibility for clamping off of the clam clamp on the outside. You will notice also, I've got three different styles of clamps here. I tested these out years ago. Um, obviously I love the clam clamps, they're the best out there. These are kind of a Chinese knockoff. You can get these from Wood River, O School sells them, they're on Amazon. And then these are an old school Hartford clamp. I just got these because I wanted to test them out a couple years ago, but I try and just use the clam clamps for the most part. Another little note here, you'll notice on this clamp, uh, I've got three teeth right here. Whenever I do a casing this large, I actually like to use all four teeth. With these clamps, these teeth are removable, you just back them out from the back side here and then they'll stow right here on the side. Um, these are uh, threaded in right there. So I'm gonna actually grab a different one right here. What I typically like is to have all four pins. But whenever we're doing a more typical, whenever we're doing our more typical three and a quarter inch casing install, I only use three pins. On a large casing like this, I like to have all four because you want that extra grip to pull it together. You always want to try and wipe as much of the glue off as possible because if you leave it on there it's a pain to try and sand through later. Down here in the very corner it's hard to wipe that and get that glue out of there. If you keep a little tool around of some kind that can just get in there from both sides and get that cleaned out it'll help you a lot later on. You could use a flat bar as well just something to get in that corner and clean that out. At this point we've got our miters glued up so what do we do next? Uh, we could just move these off the table, set them on a wall. I personally like to do my sanding of the miters right here on the table. It's easier, it's at a gentleman's height and just more efficient in general. So I like to use a power sander. If you get these just right, you could get by just sanding them by hand, but these little triangle sanders work great. Uh, I use this one from Festool, the DTS 400 for casing all the time. So we'll just hit this real quick. Now because we had these perfectly aligned when we assembled them, the sanding literally only takes a matter of seconds. You're basically just cleaning off that little bit of excess glue and it's absolutely perfect at this point. So I can't stress enough, take the time, make sure you get the miters aligned when you do this because if this was off a 30 second, then I'm gonna have to sit here for a minute or two sanding away on this. 
The miter's not going to look great, and it's just a waste in general. Let's come over here real quick to this next one. Let's take a nice close look at it. This one's pretty good. It's not perfect, but not bad. So let's come in real close here. That is absolutely perfect. I spent maybe a few seconds, five seconds on it and it's nice and flush all the way across there. I'll go ahead and hit the top up here as well. One thing that absolutely drives me crazy, do not sit here with the corner of your sanding pad grinding into the profile. One, it's gonna make so the profile's not flat. Two, it's gonna ruin your sanding pad and it's gonna end up looking like that. Keep it nice and flat and you can use all three corners of your sander to get in here. You don't have to just use the front. You can come back here to the back and come in like that as well. Let's talk again about what makes a strong miter joint. Again, with wood glue, we need clamping pressure. Clamping pressure is gonna push the two pieces together. It's gonna force the excess glue out and it's gonna make that really strong. So whenever I look at this and I see just an absolutely tight miter and it's put together square, I know that this is very strong. The fact that we also have a tenon in here with a biscuit in this area means that it's even another layer of strength. So that's what we wanna see. If I was doing this and I had a gap down here at the bottom and it was filled up with glue, I know that that joint is compromised. It's not gonna be very strong. But this is what you wanna see. Everything nice and tight, pushed together square. It's gonna be very, very good. So typically when we're trimming full tilt, we've got a nice flow going where we'll have pieces cut, we'll assemble using all of our clamps and we'll stack our pieces on the wall. At that point, after you've used all your clamps, you can also go to cutting some more pieces to give the glue a little bit more time to dry. Otherwise, if I was through all my clamps, I would start popping this set off and move on to a fresh set. Works pretty well, as long as you give these joints a half hour to set up, um, they're not gonna break apart, but I like to give them a day if possible before I really stress them and start nailing them on the wall. Another thing is, if you wanna go ahead and start nailing them, just nail the inside edge on your doors and windows, then give it a day or two and go back and then blast them on with your 15 gauge nailer and even a, put a clamp on it if you've got a bad situation and that miter will resist breaking a lot better if it's had proper time to cure. Another quick note, I like to assemble as much as possible on my assembly table here, but a lot of times, especially on these big custom homes, we'll have big doors and windows that won't fit on this table. In that case, we'll a lot of times move the casing to the room where it will be installed and we'll just assemble it on the floor. But we'll do all of our biscuit prep and stuff like that right here and then put it together on the floor on those really big units. So some guys might think, oh, well, I'll assemble my, my casing on each door or each window. And in that case, I'd be coming up here, I'd be nailing one side on, I'd be gluing it up there, putting the clamp on there putting the clamp on over here, putting this piece on. The problem is you're, you're just wasting a bunch of motion doing that. In my opinion, it is way better to do everything you can assembly wise right here at my cut station, right here at my assembly table, get it all assembled and then pick it up and move it to each opening if at all possible. So guys, hopefully this has been helpful. I was pretty fortunate that early on in my career, I started that job and I was able to watch some other guys do this the wrong way. And I was actually able to see what happens to the miters just in a matter of a couple months whenever the seasons change if the miters aren't reinforced properly. So I knew early on 
um, how important this was. As a side note, on that job, all of the doors that I did, I used dominoes in the casing with clam clamps. Not a single one of them opened up. So I'm really confident in this system. Hopefully it's a little bit reassuring to you. It's helped you maybe learn something. I'm always open to learn more. If you've got any comments, let me know down below. Otherwise, we'll see you in the next video.